Well, as you can see today, I am launching into a new series with you that I'm calling Ancient Future. Sometimes you have to go backward in order to move forward in a better direction. And that is very much the spirit of where I'm about to take you here over this weekend and really the next couple of weekends. This is a series that involves going back to our roots. You know, the word radical is used a lot in our culture, but it's getting further and further away from what it really means. A lot of times when you hear somebody use the term radical, they're using it to talk about how extreme or how crazy or how intense someone is or something is. But the real meaning of radical means simply this, to the root, proceeding from the root. That's basically what radical means. It means going back to the root of something. It's something that proceeds, it's connected to the root and has come from the root. And what I want to do with you is I'm going to take us back to our roots, all the way back to the early church in the book of Acts. And it's a very specific church that I'm going to take us to here over the next three weekends because there are some things about this church that I think speak into our future as a church and speak into us as individual followers of Jesus. More about that in a second, though. So I heard about a woman telling a story about a conversation that she heard on her family vacation this past summer. Right before they left, uh, she and her husband had been admired in a pretty intense discussion over whether or not they were going to pull their kids out of public school and enroll them in a private school. And the kids overheard plenty of discussions about this in the early part of June. Well, they're traveling across the country on a family road trip this past summer, and her seven-year-old daughter announces that she needs to go to the bathroom. And so they stop off at the next kind of makeshift convenience store gas station on the side of a pretty busy interstate, and Dad said, let me go in first and check things out, (laughs) you know. And so he goes in to check things out, and he finds out they don't have any public restrooms in this convenience store slash gas station. And so he comes back, and he gets in the car, and that's when he announces that this store doesn't have any public restrooms, to which his daughter very innocently said, well, do they have any Christian ones? And that just cracks me up. And in some ways, her response of, did they have any Christian bathrooms? I know they don't have any public bathrooms, but do they have any Christian bathrooms really is a reflection of how the term is used in our culture. Today, the term Christian has been used more as an adjective in our culture. It's used to describe business people. He's a Christian business person. Christian music, Christian politicians, Christian television, Christian movies, Christian athletes, Christian bathrooms. Christian is used more as an adjective in our culture. The problem is, is that Christian can be used to mean so many different things depending upon who's using the term and what they're trying to accomplish with it. And I believe it's helpful to go back to the root of what it first meant because it could speak into our future right now. So on my break, I was meandering through the Gospels for a series in Matthew that I'm going to do beginning in December, taking us through Easter, but I was also spending some time in Acts, just doing some devotional reading on my own, and my eyes my mind, my heart kept returning over and over to a story in a part of Acts that I've never really spent some time with. It's not the most exciting part of Acts, to be honest with you, and yet something in my spirit gravitated toward this particular group of Christ followers, this particular church, and something that was said about them in this one little verse, Acts 11 and 26 The disciples were called Christians first 
at Antioch. This is the very first time the word Christian occurs in all of Scripture. And when I read this, I just found myself asking questions I've never asked before, such as, why are they called Christians first here in Acts and not in Jerusalem where the first church is? The place that launched it all on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. That's a church of several thousand. How come they're never called Christians? Really, that's how you pronounced it in many ways. How come they're not called Christians or Christians in the mother church? What was it about the disciples in Antioch that they would be called Christians? A term that floats around today. And where that led me was really into just a time of soaking in the church of Antioch and what you read in Acts 11 through Acts chapter 15. And I believe there's something here for us right now. I think we're at a critical time, not just the global church, the church in America, but I'm saying us right now. You know, there's a theologian by the name of Marva Dawn who says, every 500 years, the church holds a giant rummage sale. And if you know church history, you understand this. Every 500 years, the church holds a giant rummage sale and decides what it's going to keep and what it's going to throw out. And a lot of times that kind of thinking, a giant rummage sale, is produced by something happening on a global scale. And if you study your church history and you study your world history, you can see how these things sink together. I think we're in a critical time as believers in the country and even on the planet right now. There is a shift taking place. And I'm going to use a word now. I, I think it's an opportunity for the body of Christ to be relaunched. I think it's an opportunity for us to clarify what are the things we're to hold on to and also an opportunity for us to be confronted with the stuff that we've needed to be delivered from for a long time. And I, I don't even know exactly where, where this little three-week series is going to take us, to be perfectly frank. I'm in the middle of the mural right now. Paint is everywhere. But I know what I'm to do with you right now for today's message, and so we'll just focus on the manna for today. And I feel like there's something to the church in Antioch for us today. I'll leave it right now at that. I've been living with this church. What's interesting, returning to the term Christian, is that the term Christian wasn't a term that believers came up with. These aren't believers in how they identify themselves. It's the secular people in Antioch that calls this group Christians. Non-believers, non-Christians come up with the name Christian, if you will. Fascinating. They were Christians. That term, I-A-N, christ Ian, Ian, it, it literally means, in the original language of Acts, belonging to the party of Christ. They didn't know how else to talk about them, but they framed them as a political party. That's problematic for us today, I'm aware of that. I'm talking how they viewed. They didn't know how else to talk about this interesting group of people. These are a group of people who belong to the party of Christ. They are, if you will, they, they are Jesus people. Is how they would be spoken of. There was something about this group of people that stood out so much in the culture of Antioch that the citizens had to have a name for these folks to talk about people because that's we just label people. And so what do we call these people? And they called them Christians first in Antioch. And after spending some time with the church in Antioch, there are some themes that emerge that I think actually help us hose off the term Christian, if you will. And it gives a clarifying meaning as to what it means really to be a Christian 
Even more than that, the church in Antioch has some things that I think speak into us as a church. Before I get any more into that, a little context is helpful. Some of you remember how the book of Acts begins. It begins with Jesus giving his disciples a commission. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was Jesus' vision for his followers. They would be his witnesses. They would, what does a witness do? A witness gives testimony about him. In Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Acts tells the story of how this begins to unfold. What you need to know is that the story in Acts bottlenecks at the end of Acts chapter 7. It bottlenecks in Jerusalem. That the church is birthed in Jerusalem, Acts 1 through 7. You know that story. People come to belief in Jesus and a church grows to several thousand, but they never leave Jerusalem. They clump together like salt in a salt shaker. Acts 8, though, marks a major transition because it tells the story of how the message of Jesus and the number of believers finally began to spread beyond Jerusalem. It doesn't happen because the church in Jerusalem has a strategic plan. It doesn't happen because the church in Jerusalem has a capital campaign or even the church in Jerusalem comes together with a big fancy mission statement and affidavit. It happens because of adversity and persecution. Acts chapter 7 concludes with the story of a, of, a, of a church leader by the name of Stephen who is stoned to death by Jewish religious leaders that are trying to stamp out the Jesus movement in Jerusalem. When Stephen was killed, it was like a switch was flipped. And persecution can be particularly contagious when it's done in the name of religion. And all of a sudden, for a, a believers in Jerusalem, it must have seemed like hell had come to Jerusalem. All of hell had just broken out against them. Luke writes, Acts 1, and uh, Acts 8 and verse 1, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Luke continues to write, Acts 1, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now this is wild to me. Put this in perspective. Who would have thought that it was through persecution that Jesus' word in Acts 1 and verse 8 is going to be fulfilled? You're going to be my, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. They never leave Jerusalem, the first seven chapters. Persecution breaks out. Now they're forced into Judea and Samaria. And what was being done to squelch the movement in Jerusalem wound up only spreading it. Now let me tell you something cool about this. Luke writes his gospel in the original language. It's the Greek language. That word for scattered is literally the Greek word for scattered as in scattering seed on the ground. The Holy Spirit's saying something through Luke. The religious establishment think they're destroying the message of Jesus when in fact they're spreading it like seed. They're running for their life into Judea and Samaria. They are running for their life, but they're also spreading the message of Jesus wherever they go. The salt is now out of the shaker, but a lot of times it has to be shaken. This is what's happened. And so people begin to meet. You could tell I'm really excited about this by my voice being raised. People begin to meet Jesus throughout Judea and Samaria, through the Jesus followers who are running for their lives. You know what? Sometimes your adversity is somebody else's opportunity to meet Jesus. They're on the run for their life, but they're also telling people what's going on, telling them what's up about Jesus, and other people are responding to the news about Jesus. Sometimes your adversity is somebody else's opportunity to encounter Jesus. I know of a woman in our church, she has to deal with the adversity of blindness. She gets around via Uber, and yet she sees it as her opportunity to share something about Jesus with her Uber drivers, a couple of which who've wound up started to come to church because of that. I know of another couple in our church that lost their home, burned to the ground. An incredibly traumatic thing. It's something to be grieved, and yet they prayed, even in the midst of their tears, that something good would come out of the ashes. And over a period of time, they found themselves testifying to the contractor 
who built them a new home and the contractor wound up being baptized in their own swimming pool after it was finished. Sometimes your adversity is somebody else's opportunity to meet Jesus. That's true even in our experience as a church through the adversity of what we've been going through which is nothing compared to what people who are sick are going through, what the healthcare workers are facing right now. But just in, in the world of, of our church and how we go about the mission of Jesus, we, would have, we probably would have never done what we've needed to do to do what we do better in the online world had things not been shut down the way they were last year. And yet we are seeing people come to Jesus in the digital space that we might not have ever been in a position for that to happen and to participate in that were it not for the ad global adversity we were in the middle of. How would it change your life if you began to see your adversity this week as a potential, really, someone else's opportunity to encounter something of Jesus through you? Now you're ready to read the story of Antioch, Acts 11 and 19. Now those who had been scattered, there's that word again, scattered like seed. Those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. We'll get to that in a second. Some of them, however, aren't you grateful for the however people in the world? Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the, what's that next word? Lord Jesus. Oh, isn't that a nice coincidence? We've been talking about Jesus as Lord the last couple of weeks. I love it when a plan comes together. I didn't see this plan coming together a few weeks ago telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And here you already see the importance of what's happening in Antioch. You notice that when the believers in Jerusalem scattered, they're mentioned as spreading the word only among Jews. Why is that? Well, a lot of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem had trouble really believing that the message of Jesus was for all the non-Jews and the Gentiles out there as well. They had centuries and centuries of teaching about how God's people were the Jews and everyone else was unclean and that the Messiah is a Jewish Messiah. They had yet to fully grasp the whole mission of Jesus that's for the whole world. And so they're selective in who they testify to. They only testify to other Jews they run into. Now, sometimes we do the same thing. I'm selective in who I'll take a chance with. No. So that's what's going on. They're selective in who they testify to. And by the way, they learn it from their leaders. One chapter earlier in Acts chapter 10, you have Peter who's from Jerusalem. And you remember the story of Peter winds up at a Roman centurion Cornelius' house, but that's only after he has a vision and people come to get him. And then he gets there and he's preaching and the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all the Roman family and Peter's like, he's stunned. And he asks this question at the end of 10, what? Well, What's to keep me now from baptizing them? What does that tell you? Peter was trying to keep them from being baptized. Even he had trouble believing that the message of Jesus was for the whole world. And so they learn it from their leaders. They come by it honestly. Peter's a leader in Jerusalem thinking this way. But what happens in Antioch is there are some believers who depart from the program. I love that word, however. Some of them, however... Men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they go to Antioch. They begin to speak to Greeks also. They tell them the good news about the Lord Jesus. We don't know why they did it, but we know they did it, and it was God's will they did it because you read this in verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I love that. When, the, when those people told the Greeks, 
The good news about the Lord Jesus, the Lord's hand was with them. I'm going to tell you what, when news about the Lord Jesus, when, when news about the Lord Jesus is shared, you can expect a hand from God. A great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So now you've got this growing group of Gentiles, non-Jewish people, that are suddenly believing and they're turning to Jesus. Okay. News about this reaches the mother church in Jerusalem headquarters and they decide we need to send a cat down there it's one of our cool leaders we need to send a leader down there to investigate this thing we're hearing about gentiles coming to faith and our jewish messiah we want to know what's up on this and so they send a dude named barnabas to antioch now i love what verse 23 says when he arrived barnabas and saw what the grace of god had done stop right there that's so good Barnabas comes down there, and how is it framed? When he arrives, he sees what the grace of God had done. The church in Antioch gets its beginning because of the grace of God. There's no other way you get a beginning but by the grace of God. Amen? He sees what the grace of God had done. This move of people responding to the message of Jesus. And even more than that, what is he seeing? He's seeing Jewish believers and Gentile believers interact with one another. You have a group of people who've come together on the commonality of their confession that Jesus is Lord. You'll see why this is significant here in just a second. It's Jesus that's brought them together. These people from a Jewish background, these people from a Gentile background, there's a lot for them to learn, though, because now they're having to reconsider everything they've ever thought about life, and they're having to relook at everything through the lens of Jesus. This is what's going on. So Barnabas... He encourages them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. You'll read that, a couple more verses. And you read about more people being brought to the Lord. And so Barnabas decides, I need some help with these new believers. And so what does Barnabas do? He takes off for Tarsus, that's a town, to look for a dude named Saul. Tarsus is 100 miles away. This is a long trip. And he wants to go get a guy named Saul. Saul is a Jewish man who, you know his story from Acts 9, he's turned to the Lord in recent years, but he's been laying low. Why? Because Saul's a man who has no home. The Jewish religious establishment that he was once a part of now wants to kill him because he's become a traitor. He's left him and followed Jesus. And the early church in Jerusalem doesn't yet believe he's for real. They think he's a faker. They don't want anything to do with him because they remember him as persecuting them. Saul's a dude. He's got no home. The people he left want to kill him. And the believing church, they're not ready to handle him yet. And so Saul is laying low. It's Barnabas, if you remember, in Acts chapter 9 that actually saved Saul's life, if you remember, when the Jews are out to kill Saul after he begins to follow Jesus. And Saul comes to the church and the church won't let him in the door. You remember that in Acts chapter 9? And Barnabas has to come to Saul's defense and go, hey, listen, this thing is legit. He really has turned to Jesus. Now it's Barnabas, who he saved his life earlier. Now he's going down to get him and to introduce him to public ministry. Barnabas is a hero behind the giant that is Saul. Saul's a lot to offer. He's a rabbi who knows the scriptures of the Old Testament like the back of his hand, but now he knows Jesus. And then you read this in Acts 11 and 26. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The first time the word church occurs in Antioch is here. By the way, it's so so important. That's what you have when you have a group of people who've come together on their common confession that Jesus is Lord, believe in the good news that Jesus is Lord, and have turned to him as Lord. You have a church. What a church is, a church is a collection of people who believe that the news is true, that Jesus is Lord. 
and they've turned their life toward that. That's what a church is. A church is a group of people that have embraced this news as reality and are attempting to rearrange all their life around this reality. But there's a lot to consider about their life. Their whole world's being reframed. Jesus has brought them together. There's a lot for them to learn. And, and, and so Barnabas and Saul are with them for a while teaching. They teach them for about a year. And the citizens of Antioch who are watching this take place begin to try, we have to have a name for this group. And so they call them Christians. What did the citizens of Antioch see? about them that made them label them in such a way. I'll close by giving you two things. I think they speak to us today. The first is this. They were noted as Christians because of their public profession of the Lord Jesus. I know that sounds simple, but I want to drill in on this. The church in Antioch came into existence because some men arrived from Cyprus and Cyrene telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. That's how the whole thing begins with a few people telling others the good news of the Lord Jesus. And people turn to Jesus, they experience Jesus for themselves, and a gathering emerges. By the way, please get this right. When those men arrived in Antioch, they did not arrive to plant a church. They were simply arriving and telling people the good news about the Lord Jesus. The church is a result of a number of people who've turned to the Lord and found common ground and they've started coming together. Jesus is the main subject. They didn't show up to plant a church. They were just telling people the good news of Jesus. A church is what popped out on the other end. Jesus is the main subject. And apparently the believers in Antioch kept the main thing the main thing because the citizens of Antioch began to call those people Christians. They they began to call those people, those people belong to the party of Christ. Why? Because the believers must have been having the name of Jesus on their lips a lot. You're known by what you talk about a lot of times. You know, we label people. Oh, they're a fill-in-the-blank-ite, you know. They were Jesus people. And apparently the believers in Antioch were so clear about who it was they were following, who it was that they believed was Lord and King, that they were named after him. The city knew who those people stood for and who those people were following and who were calling others to do so. Here's what's wild. The unbelievers didn't even know Jesus relationally in a sense. And yet they knew who the Jesus people were. Which stops and makes me want to ask myself a question. Is Jesus such a preoccupying subject in my life that I would be called a Jesus person? And is Jesus such a preoccupying subject in the life of our church that we would be called Jesus people? It doesn't mean we're perfect people. It doesn't mean that we know everything there is to know. In fact, notice they're being called Christians while they're still being taught for a year. They're in process as followers of Jesus. But I say this simply to remind us, don't let what you don't know keep you from sharing what you do know. There's a lot they didn't know. They're being taught. But apparently, they're sharing who they do know is Jesus as Lord. And by the way, speaking of people who have yet to come in faith in Christ, this is usually how people are reached. People meet Jesus through Jesus' people. That's brilliant. That's what you pay me for, by the way. I'm just joking. I know that sounds elementary, but it's really true. People meet Jesus through Jesus people. Jesus people don't have all the answers. They're in process themselves. But often there's something about the Jesus people. There's something about the Jesus person that provokes a curiosity in others around them. And people are like those people. Who are those people over there? They're Christians. What was it they noticed about them? That leads to the second thing, I think, about the believers in Antioch. I believe they were noticed because of a clear demonstration of his lordship. They were noted as Christians because of their profession of Lord Jesus. 
they were noticed because of a clear demonstration of his lordship. What was that demonstration? I'm confident that there was more than one, but I'll, I'll leave you with one. Antioch was an incredibly divided city. This city had nine walls within it, nine literal walls within it. It's how the city was engineered. It was subdivided into 18 sections, nine walls, 18 sections. You may say, why so many sections? Well, it's because it was an incredibly segregated city. And, and their people groups were separated by walls on the basis of race, their country of origin, their class, their financial status. And the walls are erected over the time for security purposes. That's why you build walls, to feel secure. You also build walls as a way of, of raising a hand and going, you're leaving one area and going to another, be on your guard. And here's, here's why this gathering of Jesus' people stood out, because it was a gathering of people from a diverse set of backgrounds, racially, geographically, and class-wise. In a city of walls, there came to be a community without walls, and people took notice. It was the first church we know of where Jewish believers and Gentile believers met together and worshiped together. That's just one example of this. If you go over to Acts chapter 13, I want you to see this real quickly. You see the leaders of the church in Antioch mentioned. I'm going to break it down for you. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. I want to break down the list for you. Barnabas was a Jew. Simeon was Niger. That word means black. He was a black African. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene's in northern Africa. Probably what we would think of as Arabic. Manaen was brought up with Herod. That's all we know about him, but he was probably part of the upper, upper class if he was brought up with Herod. Saul was Jewish, also a rabbi, formerly schooled, highly educated. You can see in this list right here, among the leaders themselves, they are quite different from one another. A variety of classes and races and nationalities. The church in Antioch is the first multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-class church. And this gathering is what's sticking out in Antioch. This was only possible because the believers there considered Jesus to be the source of their identity. Jesus transcended their race. Jesus transcended their ethnicity. Jesus transcended their nationality. Jesus transcended their class. Here's why this is such a big deal. Because up until this moment in history, who your God was was strictly dictated by the country you were from or the race that you were. If you were Roman, you worshiped Roman gods. If you were Greek, you worship Greek gods. Your country, your nationality, your ethnicity had leverage on who your gods were. Are you listening to me? Then Jesus comes along. And for these believers, everything gets flipped upside down. Jesus takes precedence over everything. These people are no longer segregated from one another, but instead they're meeting together on the basis of their commitment to and experience of Jesus as Lord, a commitment and an experience that transcends nationality and race and ethnicity and class. Why? Because walls come down when Jesus is lifted up. Jesus is Lord. That's how in a city with walls, there came to be a church without walls. What got the city's attention was a demonstration of Jesus' lordship in what was happening across classes and nationalities and ethnicities in one place. What got the city's attention was a demonstration of his lordship but what directed the city's attention was their confession of who was Lord. My desire for my life, my desire for us as a church is that we're a culture where there is a demonstration of the lordship of Jesus that gets people's attention. And then once we have their attention, we are consistent in our confession that it's Jesus that's Lord and that it's the, the cause of what it is you see. He's the root of the fruit. 
So the city had to have a name for what do we call these people? And so they called them Christians. And so I take you back to that line, that line where when Barnabas arrives and he saw what the grace of God had done, when he saw what the grace of God had done, I'm asking right now for a move of the grace of God in our lives as individuals and in our life as a church. A move of the grace of God that would bring about a demonstration of the Lordship of Jesus and the difference that Jesus as Lord makes practically in our lives. That we would be in a position that once you have somebody's attention, you would be clear in your confession and direct their attention to the one who does all things well. And so as we take communion together right now, as we think about, wow, the grace of God, the cross, of course, is yet the greatest expression of what the grace of God has done. But I would ask you, how have you seen, what have you seen the grace of God do recently? And what does it mean for you to turn to Jesus right now? This is our future. Antioch's past, a demonstration of his lordship, and then a confession of his lordship. And may it happen over and over and over. Lord, I thank you for your presence right now. I thank you for your presence, Lord. We ask that your grace would continue to move among us. We acknowledge the cross. We're grateful for Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection that makes it possible for all things to be made new in our life. And we open ourselves up for your grace to move in a thousand different ways for your glory, Lord. And what was done in Antioch, may it be done among us and in us and through us to touch a world around us through Christ. Amen.